Good morning everybody, Pastor Drew from Lighthouse Church. Pastor Kerry and I welcome you today. If it's your first time, very welcome. Um, we look forward to you being blessed by today's service. We have a time of praise and worship, a time of devotion. It is our communion service day, so there's a time to take communion together. Also, we have a message from the Billy Graham Association today, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association today, on the legacy of the gospel. And I'd like you to consider what is the legacy that you are leaving behind. I look forward to speaking to you and seeing you again soon. Take care, God bless. Until we meet again, or Jesus returns.
want to see you I want to see you I would like to encourage you to pray so that you would draw closer to the Lord. I urge you to draw closer to Jesus Christ. For the one who hungers, he is the bread of life. For the one who thirsts, he is living water. For the one that is lost and needs guidance, Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. For the one who needs a defender, he is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Saints, when you draw closer to the Lord, you are moving towards wholeness and purity. When you draw closer to him, you'll find him to be a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an eternal Father, and the Prince of Peace, according to Isaiah 9 verse 6. When you draw close to the Lord, you will find Mark 10 verse 27 to be true. And you'll see that with men, it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. James 4 verse 8 says, Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts you double-minded. God is the only one who can supply all your needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He is the only one who will cause Proverbs 3 verse 24 to become a reality in your life. And you will find that when you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yes, you will lie down and your sleep will be sweet. So don't allow that problem to overwhelm you. Don't allow that burden to weigh you down. Do not allow the enemy to distract you. All you need can be found in Christ. And so may the peace of the Lord be upon your heart. May your eyes remain fixed on the perfect work that was done on the cross. May your faith stand on the solid rock that is Christ Jesus. May you find joy and triumph, victory and gladness as you chase the presence of God. May you find him to be a certain God in the midst of an uncertain world. Jeremiah 33 verse 3 says, Call to me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. So lift your faith and call on him. Call on his name, the name above all names. Call on him expecting that he'll answer you. Expect and believe that he will show you great and mighty things just as he said in his word. Now let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are my deliverer at a time that I am desperate to be saved. You're my healer when I am in need of healing. You are the one who restores when I am lacking. You, Lord, you're my refuge every time that I need safety and protection. You are Jehovah Jireh, my provider, when all else fails around me. And so I honor you, and I thank you. Lord, I bless your holy name, and I worship you. Father, I pray for every believer under the sound of my voice right now. Everyone who needs peace, May they know you to be the Prince of Peace. Every person that needs comfort, 
May they know you to be a loving father. God, I pray for each person who is seeking to be made whole. Be the one who will mend their hearts and souls. And Father, would you extend your mercy to the one who needs reassurance, the one who needs strength. May they know your word to be true. Your word which says in Jeremiah 29 verse 11, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Thank you for your word, because I know that the Almighty Creator has good thoughts about me. The great I am thinks thoughts of peace and not of evil towards me. And because of that, I can confidently say that you are my safe place and you are my strong tower. You're my Lord and my Savior. I trust in you to be with me always, to never leave me nor forsake me, just as you have promised in your word. You, Lord Jesus, you're faithful, you're just, and you are loving. I trust and believe that you will strengthen me and protect me from the evil one. Father, as your children, we need to hear your voice, so I'm asking that you would speak to us, Father. May the voice of your Holy Spirit be heard in our hearts. Your word says in Exodus 15, verse 2, The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. God, I thank you for your goodness. And it's because you're good. It's because you first loved me before I was ever formed in my mother's womb. It's because you have proven your love time and time again. It's because of all these reasons that I would rather dwell and abide in your presence than anywhere else. So I pray, Father, I pray that your presence would always surround me. Be my shelter, Lord Jesus, my safety net, my source of hope. When your presence is with me, then I can let go of all my worries. I can let go of everything that can make me anxious. I'm no longer fearful in your presence. Goodness and mercy follow me when I am in your presence. And just your presence alone, it will solve every issue in my life. Because in your presence, there is strength, there is peace, there is love and everlasting life. That's why I draw near to you. I desire to live a life that is close to you because when I'm close to you, I am hidden from the enemy. I believe that you, Lord Jesus, are the only thing that still remains certain, even in this world that is filled with uncertainty. I praise you for you are worthy. You are God and you're God alone. You are faithful. You're a kind God. You're the one who loves us and only wants the best for us. Lord, I acknowledge you as the mighty creator, all powerful, perfect in all your ways, and the one who is in total control over our lives. Father, I thank you for listening to this prayer. I thank you for hearing me, Lord. It is in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that I pray this prayer. Amen.
when the music fades. Thank you. 
beginning there was light and life and love a father loving his son in the joy of the holy spirit and everything has come from light and life and love but we look today at the world and we see it's not like that we see a world full of darkness and death and disconnection where's that come from well we've turned from the light and when you turn from light where else do you go but darkness when you turn from love where else do you go but disconnection when you turn from life where else do you go but death but then what does love do when love sees the beloved in trouble? Love says, your pit will be my pit. Your debts will be my debts. Your darkness will be my darkness. Your death will be my death. So who is Jesus? He's the son of the father who came as our brother to be with us in the darkness, to take that darkness on himself, that death, that disconnection that we all deserve for turning from God. He took it on himself on the cross. He plunged it down to the hell that it deserves. And then he rose up again to light and life and love. And he says, you in the darkness, do you want my light? You in death, do you want my life? You in disconnection, do you want my love? And anyone who turns and says yes to Jesus, we now belong to him. We get his father as our father. We get his spirit as our spirit. We get his future as our future. It's for free and it's forever. So do you want Jesus? What do you say to the critic who says that that uh, gospel message is too simplistic these days? There are many people that disagree when Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You either have to say he was a maniac or accept by faith that he was who he claimed to be. You say, Franklin, why Jesus? We see churches, we see symbols of Christianity. Is irrelevant. Bible speaks to everything that's going on in our culture today. My granddaddy was bold, my dad was bold. I want to be bold. Some people ask, is he relevant? Can he change lives today? today. today. Our granddad's last will and testament. You see a sense of the urgency of the gospel. We don't always know what the end is going to be. We want to make our life count. My name is Will Graham. 
I'm a student of history. I love searching things out for myself. As the grandson of Billy Graham and the oldest son of Franklin Graham, I realized that I'd be given a unique legacy in life. I think it's kind of neat tonight that we have three generations on the platform at once. We have Mr. Graham. Looking back over the decades, I can see God working through both my father and grandfather. Even though they came from different generations and confronted different challenges, they both understood a timeless truth that everyone must face. Um, well, this is a real simple question. How do you feel about hearing your son preach for the first time? I understand this is the first time. Well, I've heard him on tape. And the thing that uh, thrills me is uh, how straight he is on the gospel and how bold he is and how the Lord has anointed him and called him. Because you see, it's Christ that died on the cross for you and for me. And tonight, God is willing to forgive you if you're willing to come to him through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man comes unto the Father but by me. Growing up, I learned a lot by watching my dad preach, but I learned even more by spending time with him. I came up from you. That's the first time I've been on 321 in years. <laughs> As you've gotten older, you've, you switch gears and you go on with a more sense of an urgency. Well, when God gives you an opportunity in life to preach, you know, you just take it. Of course, people would rather hear Billy Graham than not me. <laughs> Same for me. They would rather hear Billy Graham or Franklin Graham rather than me. But. The last one we did together was Baltimore. Baltimore. That was like 06 or something. Having this family legacy of proclaiming the gospel is a gift. No matter what's happening in our culture or country, Jesus is always relevant. America is being stripped of its biblical heritage and God-inspired foundations. We cannot afford to be timid. We've got to be willing to take a stand for Jesus Christ. My only hope is in Almighty God and His Son, Jesus Christ. My dad's bold. And so was my granddad. My granddad just didn't have the same type of opposition because it was more of a Christian culture back then. Today, it's a very anti-Christian environment out there. Especially in the media world, the news world. Tonight, one of the most powerful evangelical voices of the nation. Reverend Graham's son, Franklin Graham, president and CEO of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Franklin Graham joins me When it comes to doing live television interviews, there's no question there are risks. Content, and especially controversy, is king and you're going into their show in their arena with their agenda. Let's take a look at what you said. I don't know what the interviewer is going to ask me. Rarely will they ever tell you. Sometimes people hear your words and feel like there's a certain rhetoric to them. The Christian faith is not the rule for all. That's the point. Why do we need more Christians holding because on? If anything good comes out of the interview, it's because of God. If the interview gets screwed up, it's because of me. I wasn't prepared spiritually. As I'm waiting to go on the program, I'm just praying just quietly in my heart, just, Lord, give me the right words. I'm an evangelist. <laughs> I want people to know that God loves them, that God is real. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God that died for my sins and rose from the grave. When He died on that cross, He died for me. He died for you, Christian. There's power in the gospel message, and God uses that. God will forgive I, our sins. I know you're going to be in church today. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> we as Christians need to be bold, and we need to stand up, and we need to be heard. Even if we're criticized, even if we're ridiculed, it doesn't matter. When God has called you to do something, He'll give you the strength to do it. In the fall of 2020, the country was hurting and people were afraid.
Tomorrow is a, is a special day. We have a chance to pray. In 2016, we went to all state capitals and we held a prayer rally on the state capitol. And people said, well, Franklin, are we going to finish in Washington? No, I don't think so. I just didn't have a burden. But it wasn't until the pandemic hit and we saw the country locked down. We saw people gripped in fear. And I felt the Lord just put a burden on my heart to come to Washington to hold a prayer march. We're at a crossroads now. I don't know how many people might come. I have, have no clue. But our country has lost its way. Jesus said, I'm the way. He said, I'm the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. We want to lift up the name of Jesus Christ as we march. How important it is to lift him up. You are watching an extraordinary event in our nation's capital, Prayer March 2020. Everybody understands that our nation's in trouble. And everyone's a little confused as to what to do. But God, God can fix this. And we're here today to pray and to call upon the name of Almighty God. Prayer is what can change things. It's what moves in people's hearts. And that's what we're seeing so many thousands, tens of thousands of people here. This is a time to stand up and be counted. You don't put your lamp under a bushel. We need to put the lamp back on the stand so that it gives light to the nation. As a grandson of Billy Graham, my search to find out all I can about this legacy has turned up a lot of interesting stories. One in particular really caught my attention. The Billy Graham Evangelistic Association might never have happened without a risky step of faith. There's these two men, Walter Bennett and Fred Diner. They proposed this thing to my grandfather. You should do this. You need to be on national radio. They followed me everywhere I went and called me and did everything they could. They said, we know God wants you on radio. Now you gotta remember, radio is king in the 50s. Television is out, but no one has it. It's a new technology. Radio was still dominant. And I said, well, we don't have the money. I don't have the ability. This is uh, not my field. But they kept on and on and on. Finally, it came down. It was in Portland, Oregon in 1950. He was staying at the Multnomah Hotel. And lo and behold, Walter Bennett and Fred Dinert walk in again. And so Bill talked to them, and Bill said, well, let's come up to my room and we'll pray together. And then in their prayer, he said, oh God, if you want us to be on radio tonight, give us $25,000. That's what it was gonna to take to sign a 13-week contract. We claimed it by faith that if God wanted us to do this, he would send in that much money. Finally, I said, all right, if we get $25,000 tonight, we're not going to take a collection, but if they come by the office and leave $25,000 on their way out, I'll consider that an answer. They said, well, that'll never happen. 
We've been praying for many weeks and months and now almost a year that God might send a great revival to this city. Now well, people began to line up when the meeting was over. And we were there for at least an hour. Man, there were notes, there were pledges, there were uh, bills in there. They told me that they had received $24,000. And Walter and Fred said, oh, that's an answer to prayer. We'll start on Radio Meet. I said, no, we said 25,000. We walked back to the hotel. I said to Grady, I said, Grady, go buy our boxes in the hotel and see if there's any messages for us. And he went and found two letters. There was one with a check from a dear friend in Texas. He had sent a check to Mark, you're talking about like a week earlier, for $500. Another letter from another friend came and said, we believe that you're supposed to be on radio for $500. These are all mailed a week before he even said anything about, because he only said 25,000 that night. And he opens them that night. My granddad said, well, I can't explain, but God gave us the $25,000. We're gonna take it as a sign of faith. So that's how it began not knowing, of course, what God was going to do. It's one of the most incredible stories because it's really the beginning of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, which he had never dreamed of. You must come by faith. You don't see Christ with your naked eye. You believe that he's there, and you accept him by faith. Now for his message today, here is Billy Graham. And he was on radio for the rest of his life. Because the, the Word of God is alive. My father uh, just believed that God would give him the resources that he would need to get the job done. And God, over the years, his entire life was like that. He had a plan for our lives. He's got a plan for your life if you surrender to him. You may wonder who this is. This is my son, Franklin. In 2000, Billy Graham asked Franklin Graham to take over the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Can you imagine, as a son, stepping into those shoes? That would be incredibly hard. The pressure would be intense. This is a big decision, and it has not come easy. When Franklin assumed day-to-day -day leadership, there's no question that many people were watching him to see what he would do, how it would go. The Great Commission is a call to each and every believer, and the task of evangelism is not through. When my dad took over, one of the things he noticed is that there's this big sum of money it was like a rainy day fund. My father came out of the Depression. And out of the Depression, all the banks here in Charlotte that reopened after the Depression, the only one that didn't reopen was the one that my grandfather had his money in. So the, he lost his money that was in the bank. He still had the farm. But that was a hard thing for my father. And so it had an impression he always saved. And so if we came at the end of the year, if there was budget and hadn't been spent, he would put it over into future ministries account. But when I took over, I said, Daddy, I don't plan just to, to manage that money. People gave it for evangelism. I want to spend it for evangelism. He said, Franklin, I want you to. Give me a plan on how you want to do that. Dad decided a good way of spending that money down was this initiative called My Hope. My Hope project was an ambitious uh, project to reach, actually, the whole world. Franklin's vision was to take messages and lip sync them into local languages and put them on television. And go buy TV time in countries that will sell us time. And my father said, okay, let's do it. We all thought, can we actually pull this off in all these cultures, all these languages? There's no question there was risk involved. It seemed like every country we went into there was this question in our minds, how in the world can this possibly happen? So we went to Central America and we bought time. Then we went to Africa. India, Russia, 
took it around the world, places that you would never be able to get the gospel into. We spent every dime of that money that had been saved up before my father passed away. This is a safety net the organization could have had. Dad said, Jesus is going to be our safety net. It's not going to be money. The dynamic way they share the gospel touched millions of people around the world. Because of the work of My Hope, we saw more people start to come to know Christ than any other time in BJ's history. We don't always know what the end is going to be. Sometimes we just have to trust God and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, realizing that God will somehow work it out. My grandfather often said that one of the greatest surprises of his life was the brevity of it. Even though he lived a century, he was amazed at how quickly time had slipped away. His final wishes, recorded in his will, reveal a singular urgency and focus. I ask my children and grandchildren to maintain and defend at all hazards and at any cost of personal sacrifice the blessed doctrine of complete atonement for sin through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you read this, I will be safely with Jesus in paradise. Time on earth is so short. It seems only yesterday that I was a little boy playing on the farm near Charlotte. Have you read that before? Mm -mm. It's his voice. You know, when I think of uh, my granddad's last will and testament here, you know, you see a sense of, of the urgency of the gospel. Time is short, and he knew that. You know, and he references here, you know, I felt like he was still a young boy at 99. You think of 99 years going by, you know, man, that's a long time. just like that. So many times in life we chase after the things that really don't matter. And here's my red day saying, the thing that only matters is pursuing Jesus in his kingdom. There's an urgency to the gospel. This is life changing. This is your one chance that you may ever have. Don't let it get past you. When my father uh, wrote the will, he wanted to be a, a spiritual document, not just a, a legal document. Of course, the children would be reading this, but it would be a public document and that other people would be reading it too. He made sure that the gospel was clear and the purpose of that will was, was eternity, and he wanted them to understand eternity. I know that's one of the things I've seen in your life, Dad, just in the last few years. It's uh, as you've gotten older, you've you switched gears and you've gone faster and faster and uh, with a more sense of an urgency later in your later years. Well, I've always felt, well, when God gives you an opportunity in life, uh, you just take it. There is a sense of urgency and we'd better do what God's called us to do and let's, let's get on about doing it because we don't have much time left. So I think that's important. I believe time to be very short and uh, it's either heaven or hell. The only way we'll get to heaven is through faith in Jesus Christ. 
I feel it's very urgent. All of us need to be bold and share the hope of the gospel with a lost and dying world. Your decision today is between life and death. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says, but the gift of God is eternal life. When you trust in God, you just gotta be bold. And that's one of the things I pray now before I get up and say, Lord, help me to preach clear. Lord, help me to do it with compassion and with a sense of urgency. You may never have another chance like tonight to make a decision concerning Jesus. You need to accept Christ tonight. He'll turn your life upside down. This will be the most important decision you'll ever make in life and no one can make it for you. He'll give you joy, he'll give you peace, he'll give you a reason for getting up in the morning. Come to him right now, come on. There's a world out there that's dying. They're separated from God by sin. What are you gonna do about it? I'm convinced that the greatest act of love we can ever perform for another person is to tell him about God's love for him in Christ. Come away, King of people. Come away, King of we need to be the light of the world. We're not just hiding under a bushel. We're to set it up so the whole world can see it. My father and grandfather have been clear that this ministry is about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in a changing world, this message will always be relevant. Jesus is our only hope.
sovereign Lord. We recognize that this is a holy moment. We honor your presence here. We honor your presence here in our midst. We honor you, King Jesus. We honor you. And we're asking for the sake of nations, for the sake of a shift in this nation, that you would pour out your spirit, just like the rain, just like the rain, that you would come and you would pour out your spirit. Begin to pour out your spirit tonight. Pour out your precious Holy Spirit tonight. Father, we ask you for more of the Holy Spirit, for more of the Holy Spirit. We welcome the ministry of the Holy Spirit. 